So it is my great uh, pleasure and a privilege to introduce this morning's keynote speaker, Professor Ruben Espinosa. Um, and I would just like to mention a, a, just a couple of things to give you a sense of, of where Ruben is located and the kind of contribution that he's making to the field. He's an associate professor of English at Arizona State University and associate director of the Arizona Center for Medieval and Renaissance Studies. Um, and I, I believe Ayanna Thompson is, is the director. So you work closely with Ayanna, who was our keynote speaker here in 2019. Um, he's the author most recently of Shakespeare on the Shades of Racism, 2021. Previous work, Masculinity and Marian Efficacy in Shakespeare's England from 2011. And, and, and a work that I think has had a, a, a real impact on the field is a, is a, a co-edited work, um, Shakespeare and Immigration, 2014. And you heard uh, last night about um, the particular contribution that he made to one of the texts that came out of our last conference, um, a co-edited special issue of Shakespeare Bulletin. Um, devoted to Shakespeare and social justice in contemporary performance, which David Sterling Brown and I co-edited. In that text, in, in that piece, um, Ruben really um, asks the difficult questions um, that perhaps as scholars of, of Shakespeare today, um, uh, we really need to be giving thought to. Um, because as, as we know, the, the, the Stranger's Case, um, which is such a powerful piece and, and um, you know, uh, it, it circulated during COVID in ways that were, were impactful. Um, and that's not to be denied, but what Ruben asks us to think about is that, in fact, is that enough? Right? You know, from his position <coughs> writing, conscious of, of the way in which um, migrants are being treated on the US border, you know, is, is it enough to feel um, reassured that Shakespeare speaks into that moment? And he says, what I do know is that if scholars, educators, dramaturgs, and actors are going to encourage students and audiences to engage in meaningful political action, it's not only Moore's speech that will allow audiences to recognize their own ethical responsibilities to immigrants, strangers, and those unlike them. And he ends by saying, that you know, we need to look squarely at their barbarous temper and have an honest conversation about that as often and as loudly as is necessary. So Ruben, the, the, the work that you are busy with at the moment, your next book project, um, which is called Shakespeare on the Border, Language, Legitimacy and La Frontera, um, really promises to, to, to push us into some of these uncomfortable questions, these uncomfortable reckonings. Um, and today's work, I hope, will, will invite us there too. The Way to Dusty Death, Shakespeare and Tomorrow. Ruben, thank you. Thank you, Sandy, for that gracious introduction. And um, thank you all for being here. I, I want to start by first and foremost thanking uh, both Sandy and Chris for their ridiculously generous spirit and hospitality uh, in being here. It's, it's been amazing, um, uh, thrilling. I, I'm I, sorry, I've been saying this throughout. I, I feel a little bit loopy. It's, it's midnight back home, so I apologize if there are any points where I'm not making sense. But um, I'm, I'm thrilled to be here, uh, really excited to, to get us going and, and to listen to the papers today. Uh, before I begin, I want to offer uh, just a, a bit of a disclaimer. Uh, first and foremost, the work that I am doing is focused on the United States, and so there's going to be quite a bit of kind of U.S. centrism involved in that, and then specifically in the latter half, regionally on the southwest in the U.S., and so I'm happy to answer any questions after if you might have, I'll, I'll try to kind of unpack uh, what is happening there. Um, and then secondly, just to contextualize, um, 
You know, I, I'm, I'm indebted to a lot of people in this room who are doing work on, on Shakespeare and social justice, and I feel uh, that, that that's really a driving force in much of the work that I am doing. And so you'll notice, uh, especially the first part of my paper, this is implicitly aimed at, at potentially teaching practices, right? Uh, ways of opening doors to, I think, conversations that we, I think, should be having in the classrooms. Uh, because I think that's where a lot of that impact takes place. And so I just want to set it up in that way. Um, and then, um, yeah, just it, it, will, it will then focus on some of the work that I am, I am doing uh, currently. I like to say that I take an Ansaldúa and Gloria Ansaldúa uh, Ansaldúa approach to my work in trying to mirror the borderlands effect, right, where temporal and linear borders are disrupted. Uh, but that might be an easy way of saying that if I'm all over the map, that's the reason uh, it's there. So. The, monu the monumentalizing of Shakespeare is all too often an act that goes unexamined, and his perceived greatness is generally taken as a given. As we celebrate this year the 400th anniversary of the publication of Shakespeare's first folio, we are reminded of this tendency to aggrandize him as we are invited to reflect upon the influence of that book. In the prefatory material to the first folio, his friends John Hemmings and Henry Condell urge us to read him again and again, and if then you do not like him, surely you are in some manifest danger not to understand him. It is only our shortcomings, they suggest, that would prevent us from liking Shakespeare. He must be liked. Shortly after, in the prefatory material, Ben Jonson famously writes of Shakespeare, he was not of an age but of all time. Herein is an appeal to see Shakespeare transcend his early modern world, to see him as universal. The first folio, the book that gave us Shakespeare, as Folger Shakespeare Library tells us, does much to monumentalize him then and now. <coughs> Indeed, the last time that the first folio received such fanfare was in 2016, the anniversary of Shakespeare's death, when the Folger Shakespeare Library launched Shakespeare's American Tour where 18 of the Folgers' 82 copies of the first folio were sent to locales in all 50 states so that, the broad audience, so that broad audiences could see the book. But as Catherine Vomero Santos keenly notes in her critique of this event, what emerged was a fundamental tension between two competing principles that would come to define the folio tour, the desire to embrace multiculturalism and the tendency to make a homogenizing assumption about a shared identity and identification with Shakespeare and supposedly timeless works enclosed in the glass case. Unsurprisingly, and as Vomero Santos points out, the book was open to Hamlet's to be or not to be speech because it is, as one Los Angeles Times critic put it, Shakespeare's most famous soliloquy. I wanna linger on this idea for a bit because this attention to Hamlet is indicative of the way we have been asked over the course of history to imagine Shakespeare's vast value. Take, for example, Douglas Brewster's first chapter in the Shakespeare Museum from his book, To Be or Not To Be. Brewster says to the reader, imagine finding yourself in the Shakespeare Museum. This imagined museum with, and I quote, vast marble hallways and manifold galleries containing within them artifacts from various plays and poems and also auditory experiences where visitors listen to Shakespeare's words is clearly meant to highlight Shakespeare's greatness. After some experience with plays like Macbeth, Romeo and Juliet, and The Tempest, Brewster describes the feeling of arriving at Hamlet. Just ahead, though, you catch the sight of the most arresting of all things of all. For here, off the museum's expansive Hamlet wing, you come across an entire gallery devoted to the to be or not to be speech. Walking past rows of skulls, rapiers, and portraits of Hamlet's gone by, you step into this shadowy room set aside for Hamlet's famous soliloquy. Given that Brewster's book is entirely about the solilo soliloquy in question, one can ostensibly understand this setup. These dramatic imaginings hold within them the speech that deserves sustained attention in his mind. I draw on Brewster not only to highlight the conceptualizations that monumentalize both the author and this speech, but also to see how easy it is to lead readers to arrive at the conclusion that Hamlet and its parts are worthy of our sustained attention. They are worthy of an entire gallery in a museum. I urge you not to take that as a given. 
In today's talk, I want to interrogate how Shakespeare has been both implicitly and explicitly aligned with structures that uphold racial hierarchies, not only in our academy, but within the popular imagination. While it may seem that my intent is to give Shakespeare a good dose of side-eye, I do this only because I believe that upholding Shakespeare in the way he has been positioned points only at his dusty death. It keeps him behind glass. We need to consider what Shakespeare of tomorrow could look like. And so I also point in this talk to promising futures of Shakespeare through readings that underscore racial justice and solidarity. When we stop to consider why Hamlet has enjoyed such popularity among critics and readers over time, then we begin to see a different picture emerge. As Ian Smith says, over the centuries, the Horatian assignment to tell Hamlet's story has become the business of literary criticism. And despite the drama's singularities, Hamlet, the man, has long found a place among the critically satisfied. The singularities, of course, are telling, and Smith has been, ha, is keen to underscore this, but only after he outlines the zeal with which critics are drawn to Hamlet. And I quote, the considerable critical attention functions as a vast collective bid to tell Hamlet's story, and at the same time, suggests the popularity of the play's male protagonist with generations of scholars. William Hazlitt claimed memorably that Hamlet's speeches are as real as our own thoughts. It is we who are Hamlet. Critics identify with Hamlet personally and see in his doubts and skepticism a philosophy that resonates with their worldview and points toward a modern social ethos. As Smith goes on to highlight, such attraction to Hamlet, such a desire to identify with him, has larger implications. He writes, one obvious but too often underappreciated answer is that this claim of identification has been nurtured by an, acad an academic industry in which white male interests were historically epitomized, reflected, and affirmed in this much celebrated cerebral prince. Hamlet is not only a male protag protagonist, but he is also white, his iconic black clothing serving as a contrast with his pale northern European complexion, the failure among critics to routinely remark whiteness as fully realized racial category in all white plays, that is, where all the characters are presumed to be white unless otherwise noted, enables a normative invisibility of whiteness, which is a sign of its hegemony. Like Smith, we must recognize that the play's imagined value over the centuries has been tethered to a particularly pri privileged white readership, but this reality has gone largely unnoticed. The experience of approaching Hamlet for the first time was once described to me by a professor as something akin to the feeling of seeing also for the first time Michelangelo's David in person, of walking down the corridor in the Galleria de la Academia in Florence, Italy, and arriving at the well-lit room that holds in it the iconic sculpture only to look up at it and wonder, what do I do with it? The David looms over you and is overwhelming, as does, it seems, Hamlet. I find the symbolism behind this comparison to be perfect. Hamlet is a work that is so often imagined as beyond our reach, awe-inspiring, and meant for a particularly privileged audience. And like the David, Hamlet is also very, very white. What then are we asking our students to behold when they come to Hamlet for the first time? When approaching a text, uh, when approaching a text like Hamlet, we need to recognize in that experience an opportunity to see Shakespeare not as all-encompassing, but as a vehicle that allows us to engage with urgent social issues. We simply can't imagine ourselves as a docent guiding our students through the corridors of a museum that upholds elitist perspectives. I grant there is much to admire, but there's also so much more that can be accomplished as we look at this art with a critical eye. To that end, then, I want to highlight how this play, in its attention to notions of belonging and alienation, offers present-day audiences something beyond an awe-inspiring work which we are invited to revere. We ought to challenge the long tradition of propping up this play because of the perception that Hamlet's worldviews are somehow universal. They're not, and as such, we need to look beyond him. Indeed, there is so much more to Hamlet than Hamlet. This is not to suggest, though, that we need to ignore the eponymous hero on the contrary, I think much of what he introduces is important for us to consider, but we should untether some of the provocative issues that this play puts forward without needing to consider what it reveals about his character. Instead, we should, we should consider what it reveals about us and our own experiences. 
What is of value are the play's energies when it comes to challenging oppressive structures of power. And there are many in this play. Gender, race, patriarchal structures, religious division, and social hierarchies are all themes this play explores. From where I stand, though, Hamlet offers us an opportunity to think through why we often subscribe to social conventions that devalue the lives of so many. I highlight three separate concepts that the play puts forward that engage with issues of belonging and alienation, topics that resonate in our present moment and that open the door to meaningful discussions, hospitality, voices of subversion, and vulnerable bodies. The first line of the play offers its readers a key moment to scrutinize how to approach the play. When Barnardo asks who's there at the onset of the play, he is literally asking Francisco to identify himself. He wants to know if he is a loyal citizen of Denmark. It is Bernardo's desire to know that the man he cannot see in the darkness is like him and not a foreign threat. But the question could loom as large as the more famous to be or not to be questioned because the play deals quite forcefully with the desire to understand oneself. In the process of being asked to identify oneself, we are also invited to contemplate who we are. In other words, the question could could be posed to the play's audience itself, who's there? More provocatively, perhaps, this question also presents us with distinct opportunity to think about hospitality. The question, who's there, demands that the other identify themselves. I am reminded here of Jacques Derrida's view of hospitality when he writes, absolute hospitality requires that I open my home and that I give not only to the foreigner, but to the absolute unknown anonymous other, and that I give place to them that I let them come, that I let them arrive and take place in the place I offer them without asking of them their reciprocity or even their names. According to Derrida, true hospitality demands that we do not ask the question. It requires us to accept the stranger without reservation or need for identification. If only we were so welcoming of strangers in the United States. With this play's opening question in mind then, I want to trace through the moments in Hamlet where hospitality is more explicitly addressed before exploring why this theme matters. After Hamlet interacts with his dead father's ghost, he is energized in his desire to remember him. When Horatio expresses his famous response to the surreal events, oh, day and night, but this is wondrous strange, Hamlet responds, and therefore, as a stranger, give it welcome. There are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt of in your philosophy. The latter part of Hamlet's rejoinder is often underscored as it falls in line with his larger philosophical ponderings, but Hamlet's immediate response, and therefore, as a stranger, give it welcome, is key. It is our obligation to give welcome to strangers, and as such, these strange events should be received, should receive the same hospitable reception. Later in the play, Hamlet is more straightforward in his call for hospitality. When the actors arrive at Elsinore, Hamlet instructs Polonius to give them lodging and says, Do you hear me? Let them be well used. Polonius responds, My lord, I will use them according to their desert or deserving. Hamlet responds, God's bodykins, man, much better. Use, them af use the every man after their desert, and who shall escape whipping? Use them after your own honor and dignity. The less they deserve, the more merit is in your bounty. Hamlet's directive is clear. Treat these men not in the way they deserve to be treated, but much better. He acknowledges that these actors deserve kindness and hospitality because they come to Elsinore as strangers. We should perhaps be wondering why, in a play seemingly focused on revenge, hospitality is a re reoccurring theme. When we think about the transgressions that have occurred in the play and the grief that is consistently underscored, why is Hamlet gesturing at the law of hospitality? What does it have to do with such oppressive structures? Whether it is the ghosts or strangers who visit Denmark, the idea is that they should be welcomed with dignity. But we know that not all in Denmark are afforded such dignity. I want then to look beyond Hamlet at my last and perhaps most significant example of the play's attention to hospitality. Now, I was tempted to use the image of Ophelia right outside the door, but I, I stuck with this one. Um, so when Ophelia suffers madness as a result of the murder of her father, she speaks freely in the court in what is commonly dubbed her mad speech. When Claudius asks her how she is doing, Ophelia responds, Well, God dilled you. They say the owl was a baker's daughter. Lord, we know what we are, but know not what we may be. God be at your table. Ophelia's reference 
is to a bit of folklore familiar to Shakespeare's audience and one that presents subversive potential. The story surrounding the baker's daughter, a Christian folktale about Jesus disguised as a beggar, is squarely about hospitality. It is as follows. Our Savior went into a baker's shop where they were baking and asked for some bread to eat. The mistress of the shop immediately put a piece of dough into the oven to bake for him, but was reprimanded by her daughter, who, insisting that the piece of dough was too large, reduced to a very small size. The dough, however, immediately afterwards began to swell and presently became of most enormous size, whereupon the baker's daughter cried out, Hew, 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 which owl-like noise probably induced our Savior for her wickedness to transform her into that bird. This story is often related to children in order to deter them from such illib illiberal behavior to poor people. The story is not uncommon as it imagines Jesus or a God in disguise as a beggar to keep Christians honest and hospitable. The baker's daughter, it seems, fails the test. As a result, when she expresses who, 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 as in who is responsible for this, she is transformed into an owl. Because Ophelia is a daughter to a recently murdered father, we might read into this her own position or transformation. But within the play, she is in no position to afford nor deny hospitality, and thus such an assumption makes little sense. Herein, then, I locate the subversive energies, the, the voices of subversion, if you will, behind this illusion, which are much too often ignored. Because Ophelia has the audience of both the king and queen of Denmark, her illusion should carry with it much more weight than it is often given. It is here, then, that I see the play's attention to hospitality lean into offering uh, us voices of resistance. When Ophelia evokes this popular folktale, we need to be aware that she is answering the king himself. Claudius asks her how she is doing, and she responds that she is well, and then puts this story on the table. If this story was told to children in an effort to deter them from such illiberal behavior to poor people, we can reasonably read this as a moment where she is trying to teach Claudius how he should be treating those below him in social standing. The baker's daughter, who is also rem the, uh, the baker's daughter is who, I'm sorry, is also reminiscent of the opening question of the play, who's there? Not everyone, it seems, has a seat at God's table. In his position as king, he should be generous, hospitable, and kind. He is not. Indeed, none of those in any position of power in Hamlet are kind. This is critical because early in the play, Hamlet says in response to Claudius calling him his son a little more than, a little more than kin and less than kind, he gestures at the fact that Claudius, as his uncle and now his father, is his kin, but he is not his kind, that is, he is not his natural father. But Hamlet also uses this wordplay to suggest that Claudius is unkindly, Moreover, kind can mean both a likeness and benevolence. The very notion that this word expresses both a likeness and goodness simultaneously reveals that similitude ought to be valued. What then does this suggest about those who are unalike? Of more importance, this play puts forward the idea that the threat comes not from strangers but instead from those within. As Claudius killed his own brother and plots to murder his nephew, Wickedness abounds in Hamlet. If we are willing to scratch at the surface of corruption that this play holds within it, then we should look a bit more closely at the way Ophelia addresses it. Long before she delivers the lines I mentioned above, Ophelia is willing to take to task the oppressive structures that define her existence. She is willing to voice her dissent. Often, Ophelia is imagined as a victim, as a dutiful daughter who succumbs to madness, as a young woman caught between the will of her father and the will of her lover. But her early self-confidence tells a different story. When Laertes offers Ophelia advice before embarking on his trip to France, he straightforwardly warns her about entertaining a relationship with Hamlet. He suggests that Hamlet, Hamlet is subject to his birth. That is, as a prince, Hamlet's choice in marriage is narrow. But this moment also works to highlight the fact that Hamlet's birth, or birthright, is imagined as superior to others, including Laertes and Ophelia. This notion of birthright, of course, undergirds social hierarchies as an, and is incredibly dangerous because it suggests some individuals are born superior to others and as such some individuals are entitled to more rights. In a monarchy, this form of government sustains the power accorded to nobility, but it stems beyond the political realm as the notion of birthright often informs the way we imagine citizenship and racial hierarchies. 
Indeed, the very concept of birthright works to sustain the belief in white supremacy. And this is from the march in Charlottesville, if you're familiar with this, in the United States. Uh, and they were chanting at that point anti-Semitic remarks and racist remarks. And among them, it was blood and soil, right? Blood, birthright, and soil, the land connected to the land itself. So what then do we do with a play suggestion that birthright determines choice? One way to approach this is to take Laurent's suggestion not as a move to ask us to sympathize with those of higher social standing, but to recognize that those in higher social standing can and will take advantage of those below them. Laertes is at base warning Ophelia not to have sex with Hamlet because she is of a lower social standing. He says to her, then weigh what loss your honor may sustain if with no credent ear you list his songs or lose your heart or your chaste treasure open to his unmastered importunity. Fear it, Ophelia. Fear it, my dear sister. In other words, should Hamlet capitalize on his position of privilege, and should Ophelia agree to entertain his desires, she is the only one who stands to lose. This speaks to both social and gendered hierarchies. We may comfortably couch these attitudes in the historical past, but we likely recognize that these attitudes persist to the present. Laertes' advice then ling lingers thick in the air when we, for the first time, get a sense of Ophelia as a character. Her response straightforwardly addresses not only Laertes' hypocrisy, but the overarching patriarchal structures that inform his thinking. I shall the effect of this good lesson keep as watchman to my heart. But good, my dear brother, do not, as some ungracious pastors do, show me the steep and thorny way to heaven, was like a puffed and reckless libertine himself, the primrose path, of Dalian's treads and wrecks not his own reed. While Ophelia seems focused on the fact that Laertes is not practicing what he preaches, she is deliberate in comparing his hypocrisy to that of ungracious pastors, the symbolic religious fathers who define structures of religious and moral obedience. In short, she calls out the entire system that seeks to define proper behavior for women. The system is then rendered vulnerable. This vulnerability leads, us, leads me to consider the final point in exploring the way notions of belonging and alienation often shape this play. Vulnerable bodies, I think, define Hamlet as a prelude to the play involves regicide. The murder, uh, the murder of King Hamlet not only illustrates the vulnerability that even the most powerful person in the nation, but also the political state itself. And the death that abounds centers vulnerable bodies. In the process, we are all rendered vulnerable. Indeed, when Hamlet first encounters Polonius, he is deliberate in his desire to make Polonius feel uneasy. To this point in the play, Hamlet has already learned from the ghost that Claudius murdered the elder Hamlet. Also by this point in the play, Ophelia relates to Claudius her interactions with Hamlet, one which includes Hamlet entering her closet half-dressed and in an unstable state. With Polonius, Hamlet is nothing short of condescending. This is not uncommon with Hamlet, as he, is also, as he also treats the sextons with similar disdain. During the interaction in question, though, Polonius ultimately feels Hamlet is nonsensical in his responses, so he says to the prince, my lord, I will take my leave of you. Hamlet responds, you cannot, sir, take from me anything that I will more willingly part with all, except my life, except my life, except my life. In that repetitious answer, Hamlet makes clear his vulnerability. He means to ridicule Polonius by suggesting that Polonius taking his leave of Hamlet is something he would welcome with zeal, but then Hamlet's own wordplay leads him to the sober reality that one could at any moment take from him his own life. It underscores very vividly the vulnerability that we all face. Not one of us can say with confidence that our own life cannot be taken by another at any moment. If we think about Hamlet's rejoinder to Polonius from a neutral lens, we can see within his apprehensions about his mortality something approaching universality. However, and that's a heavily underlined however, that sense of vulnerability is very, very different for some individuals. When we recognize that the Hamlet of Shakespeare's imagination is a privileged, high-ranking white man, then it is reasonable to suggest that his sense of his own vulnerability differs vastly from the vulnerability that black and brown individuals face in our present day society. To think about this play in a cross historical manner as we should be doing with all of Shakespeare's works, I think, is to imagine those lines, except my life, except my life, except my life, as carrying with them 
a distinctly powerful valence when it comes to issues of race and racism in our day. To imagine a black person delivering Hamlet's lines is to recognize how the play's attention to notions of belonging and alienation resonate in a markedly different way. From my estimation, such a move would give this play much needed cultural relevance beyond the borders of its past. The very experience of a black person being pulled over by a police officer in the US presents life and death situations. And as such, we see how Hamlet could speak to this, how the lines in the play offer opportunities for important conversations. And I'm not alone in thinking this. In the summer of 2020, the Public Theater in New York took on the much celebrated to be or not to be speech from Hamlet in an effort to make it speak to our present moment. The public lynching of George Floyd led to widespread global protests against not only his murder, but also against the recursive acts of racial injustice. And as citizens of the US, we found ourselves in a moment. The insurrection at the US Capitol was still ahead of us, but in that summer, the world seemed focused on making sure that systemic racism was not yet again swept under the proverbial rug of our nation's history of racist violence and genocide. In their video, To Be Black, the public theater gave 30 black actors voice in performing Hamlet's speech. And I'll play the video in full now. Be or not to be. To 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 be or not to be. That, that is, is the question. Whether tis nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. Or to take arms against the sea of troubles and by opposing, end them. To die. To die. To die. To die. To sleep. To sleep. To sleep. To sleep. No more. And by a sleep we say we end the heartaches and the thousand natural shocks the flesh is heir to. Tis a consummation devoutly to be wished. To, to die. die. To, to die. die. To, to die. die. To sleep. To sleep. To sleep. To sleep. Perchance. To dream. Aye. There's the rub. For in that sleep of death, what dreams may come when we have shuffled off this mortal coil? Must give us pause. There's the respect that makes calamity a so long life. For who would bear the whips and scorns of time? The oppressor's wrong, the proud man's contumely, the pangs the of despised wrong, love, the, proud the long man's delay, the, the pangs of despised the love, the oppressor's wrong, the, 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 the proud man's contumely, the, the pangs of despised despise love, love, the long the proud delay, man's the insolence of the pangs of despised love, the laws delayed, the insolence of office, and the spurns that patient merit of the unworthy takes. The unworthy takes. When he himself when he might his quietus make, to make the bear with the bear bodkin. Who would fardels bear to grunt and sweat under a weary life? But that the dread of something after death. The undiscovered country from whose born no traveler returns puzzles the will. It makes us rather bear those ills we have than fly to others that we know not of. Thus, conscience. Thus, thus conscience does, thus conscience conscience does, does make cowards of us all. And the native hue of resolution. And thus the native hue of resolution is simply the with the pale, with the pale cast, cast of thought. thought. And enterprises of great and, and moments of great moment with this regard, moment with this regard, this regard their courage turn awry and lose the name of action. 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 Soft you now. Be all my sins remembered. Be all your sins remembered. Sure.
bread and cheese. Bear strange fruit, blood on the leaves, and blood at the root. Black Thoughtful in its design, the video puts the Black Lives Matter protests of that summer into conversation with the civil rights protests of the previous century to underscore the timelessness not of Shakespeare, Hamlet, or this speech, but rather the timelessness and recursive acts of racism in the U.S. It's incredibly powerful to see in the faces and voices of these actors the reality of unbelonging and alienation in this nation when, for so many of them, it is not a choice. It's an unflinching look at the exhaustion of existence. The truth is that I should not look at this passage, at this play, at this celebrated author in the way all those who came before me have done so, nor should our students. To see what the public theater was able to accomplish with their short film is to understand how Shakespeare does not belong in an imagined museum, but in the voices of those who can and do keep him alive in meaningful ways. And I think we saw that poignantly yesterday in, in the videos we witnessed. I, for one, do not want to walk up to this play in awe and reverence before I have read one word. Instead, I want to see how his works might make us understand our life, our world, our reality in a way we might not have considered. My own re reality for the better part of my life has been on the U.S.-Mexico border. So I would like to pivot now to consider how the uses of Shakespeare with social justice in mind that I have discussed thus far can speak to borderland experiences in the U.S., here, I seek to cross temporal borders to consider two distinct uses of Shakespeare with Chicanexes or Mexican-Americans at the forefront of my consideration. James Shapiro's attention to the staging of Othello in Corpus Christi, Texas on the eve of the Mexican-American War and through Valeria Luiselli's bold use of Shakespeare to interrogate historical reenactments in the American West in her short story, Shakespeare, New Mexico. I should point out, uh, Corpus Christi is located there. Shakespeare, New Mexico is roughly around right here between Texas and Arizona border. Um, so you get a sense of, of the locale of, of, of these pieces. So these works employ Shakespeare to promote, in the case of Shapiro and challenge, in the case of Luiselli, historical narratives that seek to define the American West and the borders, political, geographic, discursive, that have been painfully forged therein. In his chapter aptly titled Manifest Destiny, James Shapiro considers the rather infamous anecdote about Ulysses S. Grant cross-dressing to play the role of Desdemona in a staging of Othello in Corpus Christi, Texas in 1845. The production was on the eve of the Mexican-American War as U.S. soldiers began to occupy the U.S.-Mexico borderlands in preparation for that invasion. Because the U.S. Army was stationed in a city described by one of the soldiers as a God-forsaken hole, they had an army theater built for theatrical performances and some distraction. Othello was chosen as a play they would stage. Shapiro explains that there might be various reasons why they chose this particular play. And while the frustration of military life, as he says, for the, the, the many soldiers stationed there might have been one aspect of the play uh, that resonated with them, so too was a topic of race. Shapiro writes, the issue of race and amalgamation had a particular resonance for those gathered in Corpus Christi because victory in a war with Mexico meant introducing slavery into territory where it was now illegal and raising the prospect of the large-scale intermingling of white Anglo-Saxon blood with what was called the Mexican race. This seems like a rather soft way of saying that Othello appealed to that audience because they were racist. But the focal point for Shapiro is that within this enterprise, Grant was chosen for the role of Desdemona because of his looks and perhaps his voice too. While Grant rehearsed and cross-dressed with the full intent of playing Desdemona, he ultimately was not allowed to do so because his acting counterpart was uncomfortable with a man in that role. Instead, they hired a professional actress to travel to Corpus Christi and play the part. In his exploration of this would-be performance by Grant, Shapiro sees the uses of Shakespeare as clarifying the cultural tensions behind that historical moment. This is to say, Shakespeare is used to shed light on the desire to expand slavery, overtake Mexico and Mexicans, and embrace imperialism and all its awful designs. 
Despite the fact that Grant never played the part of Desdemona, the episode is indeed revealing. Shapiro writes, Still, a future general and president saw the world for a brief moment through the eyes of a white woman in love with a black man. Curiously, it was around this time that the clean-shaven Grant decided at long last to grow a beard. Perhaps on the eve of his first military campaign, his reputation for girlish looks was not something he wanted to cultivate, end quote. It is difficult to assess what exactly Grant would have seen through the eyes of that white woman authored by a white man who represents the height of language that would soon overtake an entire region and be used against its people for many future generations. The legacy of that linguistic violence persists. As Catherine Gillen and Adriana Santos powerfully argue about this episode, deployed by the US Army, Shakespeare becomes an emblem of Anglo-American whiteness and the English language which is counterpoised to indigenous African and Mexican cultures, languages, and racial identities. Shakespeare's presumed white Anglo-American purity is thus defined against the mestizaje of the borderlands. It's not enough to see in this episode the tenor of that historical moment or the mispromise of looking at race through the, through the eyes that love, but instead it's critical to see the wide-ranging violence that Shakespeare in that borderlands represents. He was brought there by white soldiers intent on invading and colonizing Mexico, stretching the reach of slavery and the reach of white supremacy. In the final part of this talk, then, I want to consider briefly two contemporary pieces that engage Shakespeare in the borderlands and reveal to us how we can use his works to push back on structures of oppression. In her short story, Shakespeare New Mexico, Louis Selly, who's a MacArthur Genius Grant winner, a brilliant, brilliant writer who's working on various projects along the border. Uh, but this is a short story that kind of started her interest in the border. So in her short story, Louis Selly traces a movement of a U.S. Mexican family leaving their profession as folklorico dancers in Chicago for the U.S. Southwest to take on the role of actors in historical reenactments. An early foreclosure on the narrator's access to Shakespeare defines negatively her relationship to acting. At the age of 12 or 13, she says, I'd memorized Macbeth's soliloquy after Lady Macbeth's death, when the English soldiers guided by Malcolm are about to enter the castle to oust and kill the unlawful king tomorrow and tomorrow and so on. When I auditioned for Macbeth's role, my drama teacher had congratulated me on my good memory and fine diction, but afterwards suggested I take on the role of a tree. As the narrator notes, the trees didn't speak a single line. So she gathers up her dignity and refuses the offer. In the aftermath of that, she says, I'd spent my whole life representing the traditional parts of China Poblana, Jarocha, Indian woman, and even Adelita in folkloric Mexican dances and, never, and had never opened my mouth on stage except to brighten up the tapping of my heels with a polite smile. Her memory of this episode makes clear the borders of who can access Shakespeare and who has voice, and it also makes clear the awful after effects of experiences that keep some from accessing that space. As an adult, the narrator follows her husband's lead as they make the long trek from Chicago to New Mexico with their two young, boy, two young boys. The site of the historical reenactments, Shakespeare, New Mexico, is a real place. Situated just south of Lordsburg, Shakespeare was once a mining town, mining town turned ghost town. As a narrator and her family perform as the Baca family and other Mexican roles as needed in a series of histor historical reenactments with characters like Doc Holliday and Billy the Kid taking center stage, Luiselli plays off the name of the new Mexican town where they perform to insert Shakespeare in her growth as an actor. The narrator says, I never tired of our reenactments. With time, I learned to love and master my scenes, putting all the devotion and care into them that our town, our Shakespeare, deserved. One can hear in her statement a type of ownership and of pride in Shakespeare. Later, she says, we were, it seemed to me, like an old time circus troupe, except that the world came to us instead of us going to the world. Our lives were free and unconstrained. They were far away from all those castrating institutions, far from servitude to unnecessary technology, and free from the weight of having to act as ourselves. They were far also from that country out there, which was always advancing on its unforgiving path 
towards progress and power far from that cruel and loveless country beyond the last little shack in our town. The irony, of course, is that the past ushered in such violence and racism. The past in the American West and the past in Shakespeare's own world. The narrator, though, finds a kind of solace in the violent racist historical reenactments because it means not having to be an actor in the real violent present world in the U.S. But it's necessary to confront that world. When she does confront it in the story, it is symbolized through the famous Western figure Billy the Kid. In the reenactment, Billy would take her character Juana Vaca captive and then take her off stage to sexually assault her. It is chilling then when the narrator describes how Billy the Kid carried himself with an air of calm assurance. He was distant, but didn't seem indifferent or insensible to the world. More than fearsome, he looked dangerously vulnerable, like those American teenagers who one fine day suddenly opened fire on their classmates without anyone ever having expected that or anything else from them. The deliberate connection Luiselli makes between the everyday nature of this violent murder and young American teenage boys is compelling because it shows that which we glorify in history continues in its grotesque, grotesqueness to our present. And yet she is drawn to Billy the Kid. She says, of all the characters in Shakespeare, Billy the Kid was undoubtedly the most complex, the saddest, and something in his blue eyes silently pleaded for salvation. To get to this imagined salvation, the narrator, the narrator decides to disrupt the script. She assaults him in an offstage, unscripted physical encounter. As they begin to kiss, Billy keeps speaking in his character. The narrator says, I laughed, unsure if anything he said was meant to be taken seriously or if he was really incapable of speaking to me as if we were two normal adults simply about to fornicate. Clearly, the cowboy speak kills the moment. And what we see in her desire to escape the role she has been enacting and take control. But he refuses and keeps reciting the same lines from character. Needle stuck, the narrator asks, standing to put her underwear back on. One anticipates this ending the scene between them and returning them to the scene outside, but instead she picks up a chair and swings it at Billy's head. As blood trickles from his head, she undresses him and ties him to a chair. She explains, then I sat astride him. You could say that, in some sense, I danced a jig on him. When I'd finished, I put a bunch of artificial roses between his legs. It is a violent turn the reader does not expect to encounter, set within a violent scene the reader is likely much too familiar with when thinking about the American West. In what is perhaps the most powerful moment of the invocation of Shakespeare's name, the narrator explains what she did after dancing her jig. She says, Shakespeare was silent, and I'd switched off the light in the prop room to be able to see from my position on the floor the burning desert stars. Acting as Juana Baca, the narrator manipulates the scene, does to Billy, the kid as she sees fit, and rewrites the ending during the reenactment. Standing next to Billy, the narrator says, holding his own revolver to his temple when the flame died, I said, out, out, brief candle. Life's but a walking shadow a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then, it is, and, and, the, and then is heard no more. It is a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. In a clear return to the tomorrow speech that she had memorized, the speech that led her to silence and the speech that allows her to find her voice on stage again, in and through Shakespeare, the narrator locates a confident sense of self, one that actively resists the oppressive and recursive violence that the reenactments offer and that the real world consistently presents for those who, throughout history, were not meant to access Shakespeare. I want to close then by sharing a video that I have shared before in many talks and that I have written about in my publications. In short, it's recycled, right? Um, to me, it's as compelling a view of Shakespeare as there is this was a production for a class I taught when I was at the University of Texas at El Paso for an assignment that asked students to produce a five minute video that puts Shakespeare into conversation with a contemporary social issue of their choice. Those are the guidelines. Produced at the tail end of the worst period of cartel violence in Juarez, Mexico, there was an average of eight murders per day at that point. These students drew on an actual incident where 16 people, mostly teenagers, were gunned down at a house party in Juarez as the framing device. 
And I should add, a lot of our students are what we call transfronterizos. So many of them live in, in Juarez, Mexico, and cross the border to go to school at the University of Texas, El Paso. And so this kind of violence was traumatic on various levels for them to witness. And, and it really was a gruesome nature. Often the cartels would, would leave hanging dead bodies uh, you know, on the overpass. Uh, heads were delivered to the mayor's office, for example, and left in boxes. It, it was really, really, really awful. Um, so uh, as you'll see, though, um, beyond the violence, the issue of linguistic identity is introduced to show how alienated Mexican nationals feel in the U.S., even in a city that has an 80% Mexican-American population. And so I'll play this video in full as well. Nunca en mi vida había visto un día tan terrible y tan hermoso. ¿Ustedes no escucharon ese sonido? Empiezo a escuchar voces que dicen, no descansarás más. No manches, qué triste visión. No iré más, me aterroriza pensar en lo que ha pasado. Si hubiera muerto una hora antes de esa fiesta, mi vida hubiese sido una bendición. Oh, horror, horror, horror. Ni la lengua ni el corazón comprenden lo que está pasando. ¿Quién anda ahí? ¿Qué? ¿Hola? Mi mente está llena de pinches escorpiones. ¿Pueden ser las cosas así? que nos sobrellevan como una nube de verano Ah, ok, gracias. No, nada. ¿A dónde vas? Ya va a empezar la clase. Mañana, y mañana, y mañana. Entra al paso lento del día a día, hasta la última sílaba del tiempo registrado, y todos nuestros ayeres han iluminado ilusos, al camino de la muerte polvorosa. Apágate, apágate, vela breve. La vida es pero una sombra, un actor mediocre, que estresa y elabora su hora en el escenario, y no se vuelve a escuchar. Es un canto contado por un idiota, lleno de sonido y furia, ¿qué significa? Nada.
when the young uh, woman disdainfully responds, of course, after her classmate fails to answer her question in English, we witness the weight of estrangement. And yet these students were deliberate in choosing not to translate the classroom scene. They make linguistic alienation a focal point for their audience. If you don't speak Spanish, then you are on the outside. For these students on the border, it isn't just the actual violence behind Macbeth that speaks to them, but also the symbolic violence enacted on them via the likes of Shakespeare, where linguistic alterity diminishes their dignity, akin to Pierre Bourdieu's view of legitimate language as a tool of oppression, or more germane to Gloria Ansaldúa's notion of linguistic terrorism, where those who are mestizos are alienated because they are never quite Mexican enough or American enough. For me, these views of Shakespeare from the border have offered a way to glimpse into understandings of Shakespeare that foreground both the weight of his cultural legacy and the promise behind new ways of envisioning his value. In the tomorrow speech that my students employed, it is difficult not to recognize a long tradition of enduring that so many who are black and brown of skin have faced in the US, where structures of racism again and again devalue us and render our lives less important then. The way the myth of Shakespeare's universality and greatness persists is not so different an enterprise than the myth that forged in, the forged in those locales. Stories get repeated and certain voices are consistently left out. To recognize how Shakespeare is used as a tool of oppression, how the proffering, granting, bestowing legitimate access to Shakespeare keeps some silence is the kind of racism that we should speak about with candor. We need to call out gatekeeping and we need to locate ways to untether Shakespeare from critical moves that imagine his universality as a safeguard against the many social and racial inequities within the Shakespeare industry. We need to consider what a Shakespeare of tomorrow might look and sound like as a way to reimagine his social capital anew. It's important that we look beyond the monument, to topple it when need be, and to locate therein not his voice, but ours. Thank you. Ruben, thank you so much for that just extraordinary paper. Um, we, uh, given that this is a 30-minute um, coffee break, longer than all of the others, I'm going to um, make the executive decision to just uh, to spend a good 10, 15 minutes, if we can, just to be able to reflect together on this extraordinary paper that Ruben has, has offered us. And um, I invite... Let me have a seat, actually. Um, <laughs> no, I'm going to put my chair oh, here. Yeah. Great. Um, I invite you all to give thought to what you, questions you might like to pose or comments you might like to make. I'm going to start with one of my own, if that's OK. Of course. So the, the question that I would like to pose to you, it, I, I noticed there was, there was something that you said which felt for me like a something that I could take on almost as a, as a um, principle for how to do this work. And that was, you were inviting us to think about this in a cross-historical manner, which you said, I think is what we should all be doing with all of Shakespeare. And I was just so struck by that because, and, and of course you've given us such an extraordinary example of how to think Shakespeare into this moment, into the particular here and now um, of the context out of which you're working. And I, I, there have been moments in my own work where I have received um, pushback, gatekeeping. I've been told, but this isn't really Shakespeare, um, what you're doing here. Um, and you've given us such an incredibly powerful example i mean that the the film um reinterpreted through the lens of black lives matter um, put in conversation with um the civil rights movement just just uh, offers us an example of the work that is possible when conscripting shakespeare into um to to be asking questions that are both within the work but, but made so much 
clearer, more focused, more powerful when put in conversations with, with, with this new moment. Um, and I, I wanted to ask you, what do you say to those critics that have some t that we've all in encountered that this isn't really Shakespeare, yeah. and and what you're doing is not legit? Yeah, that's a good, that's a great question. I I mean I I uh, quite frankly I mean now I feel I have the luxury to ignore uh, such a criticism, right, and not necessarily engage. I think I think it it comes in line with. Uh, the calls of anachronism when it comes to race studies of Shakespeare that for so long, you know, kind of kept the field from growing. But, I mean, in short, what I, what I would say to, to criticism like that is, you know, the, the stakes could not be higher at the current moment. And I think, you know, the conversations about the humanities that we're having, the death of the humanities, right? Uh, the New Yorker piece, which highlighted Arizona State University in, in thinking about how the decline of the humanities is, is, is kind of inevitable, right? Uh, I, I think, you know, with all due respect, you know, looking to Stephen Greenblatt or James Shapiro for answers, I, I don't think is right. I, th I think there, there are other scholars who are doing work that engages explicitly. And so when you're, when you're saying this, I mean, I, I, think, I think of the likes of, of Peter Erickson, right? And in, in the piece in Shakespeare and Immigration, he talks about this and he says, sometimes we have to leave Shakespeare behind. And I'm okay with that. And if that makes you feel like it's not Shakespeare enough, Again, I think I'm invested in something different. I mean, Peter Holland is here, and he, he has a great piece on, on something I've written about, uh, which is the controversy in the Tucson Independent School District when, uh, you know, the banning of books in, in Tucson as a result of young Chicanos who stood up, you know. Uh, they, they were invited by Dolores Huerta, who is a civil rights kind of leader in, in the Chicano movement. You know, she, she said to them, because they were passing legislation that was allowing them to profile, right, uh, and to arrest and to kind of get undocumented you know, individuals in prisons. You know, she said at this moment, right, Republicans hate Latinos. And the superintendent at that time was a staunch Republican and took issue with them. So he had another kind of school meeting, right, student, student assembly, where he sent his, his aide to explain to them that Republicans did not hate Latinos. Um, but they all turned their backs on that aide and, and raised their fists in the air. And it upset Tom Horn so much that he dismantled the Mexican-American studies program, right? You know, I, I look at this and I think the studies from the following year show that it increased graduation rates, right? It increased college enrollment. And, and as Peter Holland points out, he's like, it's not only about the teaching of those, you know, 60% or so Latino students, but also the 40% white students who are taking <laughs> classes to understand, right, mm -hmm. what is happening. And so, in this regard, I feel fully comfortable if they say it's not real Shakespeare. Um, I mean, it goes in line with what I'm talking about and what has been defined as real Shakespeare, right? And mm. I feel like the momentum right now is on our side uh, at, in terms of what we're doing with, with critical race studies in Shakespeare. And, and uh, yeah, mm. thankfully, I, I am indebted, as I mentioned at the onset, to, to so many who have opened these doors. And, and I do have Peter Erickson in my ear a lot of the times and thinking like, there, there, it's, it's okay. There are moments where Shakespeare is not going to be enough to say what you want to say. And so mm -hmm. Valeria Luiselli comes in, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and other individuals who I think, at, not only in, in the talks, but in our classrooms. I mean, I think that that's, that's mm -hmm. important to, to you know, bring in uh, these contemporary voices. Mm -hmm. And what you've just said, too, points to the fact that the way that Shakespeare has been defined right. as being, you know, supposedly apolitical, of course, that is very historically specific you know there, there, there's an historicism that one can bring to that version yeah. of Shakespeare as this um, you know white male subject yeah. or producing characters who are held up it, yeah, to yeah. reflect a certain way of being in the world that too can be historicized I, I absolutely yeah. I, mean, I, I think you know Jean Howard you know hit it on the head when new historicism was taking shape and she says you know we, we have to recognize that it, we we can't be objective about the past right you, you can't yeah. pretend to be objective it, it, it all comes with a kind of suggest, subjective viewpoint so mm -hmm. even in those moments early moments i think there was clear mm -hmm. indication yeah thank you colleagues is there someone who would like to ask a question or make a comment about this work no, no. Mm. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, can, yeah. Can I just repeat sure. the question quickly for those who didn't hear? Jatsma is asking that uh, there, there was uh, the hint about you know what what works in the classroom as a really fascinating space, not just in, in the, the critical space. Uh, and if you could give us a sense of that. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I will readily admit that I, I so when I started off, I mean, I was doing everything wrong <laughs> in the way of presenting Shakespeare. I would start with Shakespeare was born and you know, Stratford upon and, and go on and mythologizing the man, right? And, and that's an easy sell, by the way. I mean, students are kind of dazzled and then there's buy-in from the mm -hmm. onset. Uh, I begin my classes really by asking them, why Shakespeare? Like, you know, what, why, why, are, why are you in this class and why do you think this is a class that you are required to take? And when you think about all the other classes, especially if you're an English major, right? Mm -hmm. This often at universities is the only class for us kind of sole authored class, right? Unless it's a, 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 a different kind of course requirement here, right? But we don't, we don't get a class that is specifically about Virginia Woolf, right? I mean, you can, you can have a special topics course here, right? But we have a class that is devoted to Shakespeare. And so that is required? That is required. the word required. Required, required okay. yeah. Uh, in many, in, in at least the two institutions I've been in, and I see it offered quite a bit in that regard. And so mm -hmm. it allows them the opportunity to, I think, often regurgitate what they've been taught and you know, learn about Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. And then I like to quote Ayanna Thompson, right, who says, you know, it, it's not, you know, we've been taught that it's like spinach, it's good for you, but you gotta think about, well, you know, <laughs> why is it good for you, right? And I, I, think, I think those honest entry points to allowing them to scrutinize what are we doing with this, while simultaneously, I think, I think showing them the richness of the language, the possibility behind it, right? And then uh, what I like to do is offer tools to the students that you know, are, are, again, beyond Shakespeare, right, for mm -hmm. them to come to it then in ways that I think are, are allow them to be cr critical or to see how it weighs on their lived experiences. And I won't pretend that every student production is like this. I mean, there's some, been some, quite frankly, really bad productions and, and students have missed the mark and students have, have produced racist videos. I mean, I think you know, there have been moments of that. But, Mm. That also leads to, I think, honest conversations about, about the uses of Shakespeare. Mm. Yeah. Juliana. Um, so maybe it's easier to hear me. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I was wondering, in your classes, um, this idea of having the students, which is something that I've met many people do in, in the world, the, the, the talking through Shakespeare, do you think in what, what's the meaning that you give to this? Because on the one hand, of course, this can be denouncing things through the voice of the ones who are in power. On the other hand, it can be a sort of nobilitating what you're doing, because if these people spoke with their own voice, mm -hmm. of course the video wouldn't be the same. So Shakespeare helps to mobilitate what you're doing. And I was wondering if you think that this is also a way to mediate. Is there any form of mediation, in, in your opinion, between those who have no power towards those who have power by using a kind of, so we who have no power go towards you using something that you know. So we use Shakespeare because you need Shakespeare, yeah. and therefore this is a kind of common ground. Mm. Shakespeare is a kind of mediating uh, tool, device, language for those who are not in positions of power as an offering to those exactly. yeah. in positions of power. That's a, a, a great, great question and point. I mean, I, I think, I, so the short answer would be yes. I think absolutely, you know, I, I often think about him as a vehicle, right, to have these conversations. But, you know, I also recognize the value and the power of Shakespeare in that regard. I mean, and this is, this is the honest truth, that the, the, the incident that I mentioned about the book banning, the only reason it got national attention is because Shakespeare's Tempest was on that list. Huh. So suddenly the, the story was they're banning Shakespeare in Arizona, right? It didn't matter if it was Rodolfo Acuna, it didn't matter if it was Gloria Saldua or James Baldwin even, right, who were all on that list. Yeah. It was because Shakespeare was on that list. So I think leveraging that, that capital that he holds, I think is, is a positive way of thinking about 
how we can use this, right? And, and I do think there are moments like, uh, you know, Antonio Campo Guzman, a Colombian American actor, writes about this and he says, you know, he felt like mastering Shakespeare's language gave him a sense of confidence as an actor, even if he had a thick accent, right? And here he talks about one experience of going before, uh, it, was, it was in Boston and it was a, a one performance of Julius Caesar where they brought in, you know, he describes it as inner city kids, right, who came out, he said, but going out there, he says, you know, the, the person who was playing Brutus was a kind of very handsome actor, right, who comes out and usually gets the most applause, he said, but I went out there and saw a bunch of Latino kids, right, in the audience, and he says, I am Antonio Campo Guzman and I am Julius Caesar, and he said, and it brought down the house. Like, uh -huh. they were like, they see themselves in him. So there is a way, I think, of, of thinking about how to use Shakespeare, I mean, but that's the fine balance, right, in a way of some kind of revering him in a way, but, but also thinking about how, how really engaging and understanding the language, right, it can be a source of, of pride for students and then making it their own. I will mm -hmm. say these students came to me sheepishly and said, can we do this, in, like, would it be possible to do it in Spanish? And I was like, yes, like, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. that's, and so they, they, you know, but there already is that hesitancy, right, that it's not, it's not Shakespeare, it's gonna be in Spanish. And so, I mean, I think that, that those notions of translation, I think work in, in manifold ways. Yeah. I think we, ha we have time for one more question. Okay. Do you have any advice how to fight back against that and hmm. keep your job at the same time? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Tony, asking if you have any advice about how to fight back against this nonsense and keep your job. And keep your job, yeah. I mean, so I, I, I will say I, I sympathize with those who are teaching in Florida and in states where they are, they are trying to change the curriculum in a heavy-handed way. Mm. I mean, we won't sugarcoat it, in a fascist way. I mean, this is, this is what's coming down the pike in the U.S. Um, so, I mean, I, I, I'm heavy-handed myself, as you see. I mean, I kind of am, am pretty straightforward. Uh, and I have the luxury of doing that, and I, I recognize that. I will say at ACMRS, we are right now, you know, kind of thick in the process of developing curriculum uh, via a website that we will be launching hopefully sooner than later uh, that offers uh, kind of different ways of introducing critical race studies in your classes. So it's aimed at professors who maybe want to do it but don't really kind of know how to go about it. And that's not your question. But I think in the process we are also recognizing that we can offer Trojan horses, right, and ways of bringing the material in without, you know, kind of disrupting what the legislators are putting down. And so this is deliberate. I mean, at the, at the onset, they wanted to make it all a Trojan horse, and I was like, but it's coming from ACMRS, so people are gonna know our agenda. Like, we can't, we can't pretend to do this, right? We, this is what we have, this is who we are. Uh, and I, I love that. I love that about our center, and I love that about you know our director, Ayanna Thompson. I think what we're doing, uh, it's exciting. But you know, in in that in that sense, Tony, I mean, I I I I do would err on the side of caution for for folks who want to keep their jobs. It's, it's a very precarious situation, and so I think some of what I did at the onset are ways of thinking about. I'm t I'm talking about hospitality in, in Hamlet. Like I'm not, you know. Mm -hmm wouldn't show the images that I showed, for example, in a classroom, right? But I think students are smart and they can connect the dots. Um, we have yet to see where this is gonna go and I think, I think that's mm -hmm. gonna, be, gonna be telling. Yeah. Thank I you. Would, sorry, with a more hopeful answer, by yeah. the way. Well, well just uh, to say thank you. You've given us so much to think about um, that has been so compelling. And I, in my haste initially, I, I didn't mention that you are currently Vice President of the Shakespeare Association of America, which means that you will be president next year. And it's, uh, it's heartening to see the way in which your work is being acknowledged by the field and, and supported. Um, so thank you for thank your you, work Sandy. and thank you for sharing. Thank you.